welcome to the live stream, Filmmaker IQ, John Hess here, coming at you another Wednesday. I'm not feeling great today, so I don't know how long I'll be here. So we're going to talk about canned laughter. Yes, Repro, put, let me put your comments up. I can see what's going on here. Let's see here. Ba 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 ba. Welcome to the live stream. It's another exciting edition. Now we don't. I don't really have a. a we usually do like a. Uh, yes, canned laughter. I usually do. A, we've been doing the critiques the last few weeks, and I didn't get any any requests for a new critique. Um, I didn't go back, and I did have a couple that I didn't hit, but uh, maybe we'll do that next week. But today, I figured we just talk. We just go with traditional yammer session. And uh, talk about something that I want to talk about, which are laugh tracks. Now, I, you know, obviously the internet hates laugh tracks, basically. I think you go on Reddit or something, you're, you know, you, everyone's, everyone has seen that uh, Big Bang Theory episode where they take all the laughter out and it's just awkward. Um, well, uh, you know, that's, that, I think, I think most people have an opinion that laugh tracks are, are terrible. Now, I have an opinion that, they're not terrible, but boy, boy is hell, they sure, they sure can be. And the, the, the topic today came to me when I was sitting in my dentist's office this morning. Uh, so I was already in a, in a great time, although it wasn't bad. I had to get a, my cap fell off and I had to put it back on, my crown fell off. And, uh, but, so let me give you a little bit of history. The very first movie I ever shot, the short film I ever shot, I didn't direct it, I didn't write it. I did shoot it and I did edit it. Edit it. And it had a laugh track. It was a supposed to be like a mimicking... We were trying to make something in the style of Seinfeld. Um, did we come close? Ah, you know, that's debatable. But we did consciously make a decision to, to, to use laughing guest as Dr. Grandpa. He was a dentist. Sorry, my, 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 I'm having some sort of sinus like issue where it's like dripping into my nose. So I might be like blowing my nose constantly throughout this thing. Anyhow. Oh, that was a lovely sound effect, John. ASMR. How come there are no ASMR channels for people that are sick? Are there? Maybe I just haven't looked it up yet, but are there the like ASMR channels where the person doing the ASMR is sick? And it's like all the noises of being sick. And they're like blowing their nose or they're sucking mucus. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> the terrible, terrible side, side trip, John. So the very first, uh, movie I ever shot, I was like 22 years old. It was a movie. I mean, it was a short film. It was a 30, 30 some minute short film. And it was basically a, uh, it was a sitcom. So it was decided early on that it would have a laugh track. What is ASMR? I don't know exactly what this initial stand for, but ASMR is uh is videos where they do a lot of like basically foley <laughs> if you were a filmmaker if you're a filmmaker the language is foley but i don't know what asmr maybe somebody in the chat can tell me what what uh what that uh, stands for uh and then someone says uh rio pro says i can do all the sounds by being sick just by smoking that's true all the coughing oh, there could be some covid stuff in there too anyhow so it was decided early on that this short film would have a laugh track and the director was an actor as well. He was a lead actor, and he was, you know, rehearsing the, the actors. So they inserted, purposely inserted the pregnant pause when there was supposed to be laughter. And we, we did the uh, short film, and uh, then we add the laugh track to it. And I got kind of, in, I got well versed into how to work with a laugh track. Like, you know, there are, there, when you go looking for laugh tracks, sound effects, sound assets, there's various different sizes of crowds and there's various different sizes of reactions. Sometimes the laugh is like, ah, 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 ah. And there's always that one person, right? Ever since I Love Lucy, there's that one lady in the laugh track you can clearly hear above everyone else. All right, ever since the very first sitcom, my, you know, I Love Lucy, there's that one laugh track lady. So you, you know, you, you incorporate all these things, but there are, you know, there's the, there's the laugh tracks for like a large audience, large studio audience, medium studio audience. There's the <laughs> chuckle. There's, you know, there's all different kinds of laughter, right? So we made this and I think it turned out okay for what it was. Uh, and you know, it, it's effective. Now, even back then, then we're talking early 2000s here, um, 
even back then, uh, there was kind of this anti-laugh track menta- sentimentality. And it goes way back, too. You know, it goes back it goes back to the beginning of sitcoms. Is There is, uh, if you watched, uh, what's that movie, Woody Allen, Annie Hall. There's a scene in Annie Hall where Woody Allen's like, you know, they're, they're adding laughter into his show, into this uh, appearance he's doing like on Johnny Carson. It wasn't Johnny Carson, but it was obviously something else. So, you know, and obviously laugh tracks have always been kind of looked down upon as sort of, you know, horrible, <laughs> bad, as sort of phony, I guess. Uh, but anyhow, so where, where I'm going with this, if I, I don't even know where I'm going with it necessarily, but. So we, you know, the, the director did run the film through a couple of festivals, did do a couple, you know, make some rounds with it. Nothing came of it. And somebody suggested you should take the laugh track out. And he took the laugh track out and he put it again out there. And I went and saw it without the laugh track. And I was like, he did it without my help. He should have asked me to help him. I would have tried to cut some of those pregnant pauses. But holy moly, such a different, terrible feeling. You know, like... uh it was just so stilted, you know, like someone would just say a line and there'd be like a two second pause and then someone else would say a line and it's, just, it's exactly what you see in those Big Bang Theory videos where they take the laugh track out. Very, very disjointed, very uh, disturbing. So I understand the point of laugh track and, and I think anybody that, that you know, if, you, if you've seen a comedy movie, there's a difference between seeing a comedy movie by yourself at home Versus seeing a comedy movie with your friends at home, if you're watching it together at home, or going to a movie theater that's got nobody in it versus a movie theater that has a packed full audience. Obviously, there's something about the human animal that responds to other people laughing that makes you think whatever you're watching is funnier if you hear other people laughing. It's a baseline thing. However, uh, it... (laughs) It's so jarring, though. However, when you see a, a, a TV show, which, like, I don't even know, why is that line, why are people laughing at that line? Now, Big Bang Theory, I, I honestly, I do kind of like that show because I feel like it's got some elements that are kind of funny. It's got at least trying to be funny. And there's a little bit of, there's a, to me, it feels like a little bit of humility in the, the character's, What I really hate are those sitcoms where the people are, they, they're so, they come off as so full of themselves. Oh, we're being funny and you are laughing because we're funny. We are so, so darn funny. Look at us, you know, TBS, very funny. Uh, I just, I just hate that kind of thing. I hate it with self-conscious comedy. So I was at the dentist office today and they had the Hallmark channel on and they showed, uh, they show this show called Reba. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this show. Uh, this is like I on previous live streams I have been known to go off on two broke girls as just just the lowest of low, the worst writing. Reba's better than two broke girls. I still have a deep dark hatred for two broke girls. I love I love the the, the leading lady. Uh, the the brunette girl, I think she's wonderful, but I mean, I'm glad she's made t- a ton of money doing that show, but good God, that show is awful. But Reba, oh my God, Reba is, Reba is, was bad. So th- I guess if you don't know what Reba was, it starred Reba McIntyre. If you don't, if you're not an American, Reba McIntyre is a famous country singer. Um, I couldn't tell you cause I never, I don't really listen to the country. So I don't really know uh, how, how, I mean, she's obviously famous. I, I knew who she was. I saw her, I'm, I've seen her on like award shows. So, but she had this sitcom between like 2003 and 2007. And apparently it was the number one show on Friday night on the WB network when it was airing. And it aired all the way till the WB became the CW. And then it aired for like one more year. And it, it was pulling like 4.6 million. See, Filmmaker IQ, this is what I do whenever I come across a new like IP, whenever I come across a new show that I don't know nothing about, I instantly Wikipedia it and I skip the I skip the plot line and I go straight to production notes <laughs> because I love to learn about the history of these shows and in the production of and industry side of it. So yeah, Reba started off with a record breaking like 4.6 million viewers per episode when it first aired and by the end of the time it was, by the end of its run it was doing about 3.6 million 
which I imagine is pretty good for 2003, 2007-ish. Oh, my nose is starting to, to go that. But, <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt you. Emmanuel says, I remember laughing my ass off at Reba, and then I saw you some clips on UIT, YouTube, and I thought, disappointed for my past self. Yeah, so the thing about it, is, it was like, they would just insert laughs into lines that I wouldn't even consider jokes. They were they were like the most, like, like the least funny lines. They weren't even they weren't even trying to be funny. It's like, hi, well I gotta go to the store. Well that's gonna take me a while. <laughs> yeah, the traffic's really bad today, just like every other day. <laughs> it's like the most base level humor it's like not even a joke there's no like wit there's no there's it's like you know like i when i try to write i feel like i've got these three story ideas that i want to write and i i'm i'm, I'm guilty of it look i've gone through a lot of my life i'm going to the dentist i had my i had drywall repaired the other day I've got to clean up. Oh, my God. There's so much to do. So I, I, I got to give myself a break for not being able to do all the stuff I want to do. But it's like when I sit down and I want to write something, I, I paint, I slave over certain words and I try to make, try to, like, I figure out what, if I'm trying to make a joke, I try to find the angle of funny. But this show doesn't even try. Have I ever watched a Bollywood movie? I don't think I, ha uh, I no, I haven't really. I haven't, I'm not exposed much to Bollywood. Does Bollywood have a lot of laugh tracks? Is that what that we're getting? Or was it just like a non sequitur question? I'm not being angry. I'm just, just asking. <laughs> but uh, hold on, my nose. I gotta, give me a sec here. I didn't do that right in the microphone. That's for you guys. <laughs> but uh, no, it's... So, so they showed Reba, and I was sitting there chat, like texting my friend who was watching my house, like making sure that the, making sure that the drywall guys were not like destroying the place. <laughs> they did a great job, by the way, decent price. I'd recommend them, but you guys on YouTube would they'd be outside your service area. Uh, my nose is starting to get like really stuffy, but uh, I was chatting with my friend. I'm like, this is awful. This is just just absolutely terrible. Like the, the jokes aren't aren't going anywhere. And then uh, the, the, the Reba was done, and then they played Golden Girls. Like, Golden Girls, okay, that's a classic sitcom. And I think what struck me very distinctly different between Reba and Golden Girls was Golden Girls, they put the laughs, the canned laughter. I mean, I don't think, I mean, it, obviously canned laughter. Obviously, these things are shot on a studio set, you know, so there is live laughter. Um, but they probably do add... Uh, augment it with some canned laughter but whatever whatever golden girls was what i noticed was there were long spells of the golden girls where there was no laughter like they were kind of setting up the scene so they had like they went for about three or four lines without well more than that five or six lines without a laughter back and forth back and forth back kind of they're setting up the situation and then when they all the characters come in they all throw in their little punch lines and that's what gets laugh and like I can kind of accept that because it's like, well, at least they're trying. They're making, they're trying to make these jokes, and you're seeing the characterizations come out. That okay, it wasn't like I was saying. It wasn't like, oh yeah, the traffic's really bad today. <laughs> so yeah, I I sound super nasally today. Probably my nose is really stuffed up here, super nasally. But if you watch Golden Girls, like it does, it doesn't jam you with the laugh track. It saves them at least for the joke lines. And of course, the jokes I thought were written better. Like, oh, the, there's a reverb on the David Perkins. Is the, the worst thing about uh, Big Bang Theory is the laugh track is the reverb. There's a reverb on the on the laugh track. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. That, that's that's what's so. I mean, obviously nowadays, I think with the advent of just to, I'll throw one more point while we're still talking about laugh tracks. I don't know if it's about being growing up in in America or growing up in maybe, maybe in maybe it's growing up in any like uh, industrial world where television is popular. Like, do you ever just if you go outside and you go for a walk around seven o'clock at night or something like that, like as you as you walk by people's houses, especially during summertime when people have their windows open, the only thing you can hear is the laugh track. 
right? I don't know. There's something about that. It's like a, it's like a, it's the memory, the feeling of walking around outdoors, like maybe as a kid, and even as an adult too. Like when it's summertime, it's six o'clock. The sun hasn't gone down yet. It's really nice. It's balmy, and but as you walk by people's houses, you hear the sitcom laugh tracks. I don't know that like that's you can't make out anything else, but you can hear the laugh tracks as people are watching their television shows. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so that's my point about laugh tracks. I'm not against them, but I feel like going forward, the sitcom is becoming more and more a very, very limited and dated sort of uh, style. Like, like most cutting edge comedies are not going to have laugh tracks because I think most people are going to experience something like a Curb Your Enthusiasm. Would oh, yeah, laugh track? No. You would not work with a laugh track, you know. Rest of development would not work with a laugh track. Um, let's talk about the uh, the the series I did did finish up, which is a Greg Daniels series. I really loved the first season. It was called Upload. It's available on Amazon. The entire season is available. And the original concept I, I thought was absolutely brilliant. I'm going to talk about the, the original series concept was in the future, like 2042, they invent... Uh, a way to upload your consciousness into the computer. So if you die, you have like 10 minutes, and then they stick you in this machine, and they, they can like zap your brain, and your brain goes poof, and it uploads your consciousness into the computer. And then this place called Horizon, where all the rich people have their consciousness, it's like it's like endless vacation, and they can and they they're all dead people, but people can visit them, and they have you know interactions with like the the public. There's 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 people called angels that are concierge services that kind of take care of them. Well, one of the the main contrivance of the first season is that the guy that's uploaded, he's a young guy, but he was actually killed, and his uh, his girlfriend, who's this, played wonderfully by this uh, I forget her name, but but she is. Uh, like obsessant and compulsive, she's just she's the the cl most clingiest girlfriend. But her dad has him killed for some reason. I won't go into the whole plot line. Um, but the second season is out, and I although I I really enjoyed the second season. I don't know how many people have seen have seen you guys talk about. Uh, I've seen this the show. I, I highly recommend it. I think it's the antidote to Black Mirror. I will talk about that in a second. A little more about it. But I think season two, I enjoyed it, but I didn't feel, I felt like season two was a little bit light on the concepts. Like I, I, I so loved the first season, what I felt was jam packed with different interesting ideas. I felt like the second season was very much, uh, it was like half a season's worth of ideas. I, I, and maybe because I just watched it so fast, I just ran through that whole season in basically two nights because they're about 30-minute shows. I think there's only like eight episodes. So I, I, I watched them all like back to back to back. I just binged it. Um, it's called Upload. Upload. Uh, Rio. Um, but why do I call this the antidote to Black Mirror? Because I, I feel like Black Mirror tends to be a little too fo uh, fake. I think Black Mirror is like imagining, well, Black Mirror is more like checkers, whereas I feel like this show, and I'm, it is a comedy, so I'm not trying to elevate it. This show's closer to chess than that. And what, I, what do I mean by that? I don't mean it's serious or anything like that. I mean, the problem I think a lot of times when, when people write sci-fi is like they write only in one direction. Like they think that history is is only a linear thing. Like, okay, so... This happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Which is the way, you know, bad screenwriters work with it. This, then this, then this, then this. But if you've watched the uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker video, which you, if you haven't, if you follow his channel and you haven't watched that, you've got to watch that. They talk about story, the, the but, this, but this, then this. It's, it's actually kind of, it's, kind, well, you know, not to, turn off all you right-wingers, it's kind of the Marxist theory of, of story writing. Thesis, antithesis, ant antithesis cr and then you create the, the, um, the uh, synthesis. So this happens, but this happens. So they fight each other, and then this happens, which creates this, this alternate branch. Then that hits another force, 
and they butt heads again, and then that creates another synthesis. So that kind of story, the thing with Black Mirror, it feels like it's just like, oh, this happened. It's just, it's just they, they, there's no pushback at all. Whereas this show, it feels like for every good thing, it's, it's shaded with this cynicism and not, well, I mean, it's not deeply cynical, but it is, I would say, smartly cynical about corporate power, about, you know, like the fact that we all hate corporate power and yet we all love corporate power. We all, we all want the latest corporate thing, but we hate corporate power. So it's, it's like this constant, you know, this battle between the two forces. But what's great about Upload is it, it just feels like it, it takes it to the, it takes the absurdity. Uh, it brings the absurdity of what our reality. It just shows the more of the absurdity. And Greg Daniels, if you don't know, uh, creator, he was one, he worked on King of the Hill. He, and I'm pretty sure he's on some sort of higher up on Parks and Rec. So it's that kind of humor. Uh, but I think it has, he has a little bit more to do with it. So I would definitely recommend watching uh, Upload the first season. Give the second season a go because uh, we'll, we'll see how the third season goes, you know? Because I like to see. There's a, there's a top. So if you, if you don't know what uh, Chekhov's gun is, it's a, it's a great. If you want to drop something at your next. Uh, next uh, martini or your cocktail party you go to. I'm sure you're all going, you're all guys are going to the cocktail parties after this, right? You're going to, you're going to put on your tuxedo. You know, we're not farmers. <laughs> okay. That was a joke from, uh, from uh, 30 rock, but yeah, you're going to go to your cocktail party. You can drop, you know, explain to me what Chekhov's gun is, right? Chekhov's gun is the idea that if I show you a gun in the first act of the play, that you know, by the end of the play, it's going to go off. It's going to shoot somebody. So like you never introduce something, to the audience that you're not going to use. It's, you know, it's considered weird or bad form to do that. Well, sometimes you can use Chekhov's gun to divert attention. Like, oh, it, you know, you thought it was the Chekhov's gun that killed him, but no, it was the, it was the, uh, the candlestick in the library that killed Mr. Plum. Anyhow. <laughs> so. Yeah, there you go. Mr. Mizzy says, Black Mirror jumps straight to the worst possible scenario to, um, for whatever tech they're exploring. Yeah, exactly. I, I, that's, why, that's why I feel like it, it, it's, it's what, you know, for lack of a term, it's adolescent sci-fi. And I, I, I find it, I'm old enough, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are old enough too, to know that it's not always the worst case scenario. Sometimes it's probably a scenario you didn't even think that would happen. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, so that is what I thought about Upload. That's uh, definitely worth checking out. Well, I, was, I had another thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Laugh Tracks some more, but I forgot what it Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, be, I keep seeing these ads for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I got to admit, I watched the first season, and I, 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 was, I liked it. Um, but something about that show just it's too damn cute and and i don't know if it's just me or the fact i, I don't know but i'm single and i like I, I i i'm looking for a girlfriend you know i'm single and i'm ready to mingle but it's just too goddamn cute it's you you damn it you're just too cute stop being so cute so, yeah, I keep seeing ads for it. I keep thinking, well, that looks like right show right up my alley. It's a show with, like, impeccable art design, uh, really, really, really cute lead, uh, and the really just everybody looks, you know, amazing in it. They're all, they're, everyone's well done up. You know, it's, it's a lot of good costumes, and it's got that kind of sly wit humor that Amy, whatever her name is, that did Gilmore Girls, she wrote that. So it's got that, you know, like wink and a smile kind of a humor, which I can kind of fall for. But damn, it's just too damn cute. So I refuse to watch it. I will not watch Mrs. Maisel. Uh, it's, also, it's also the weirdest, it's the weirdest case of where they uploaded the, upload, where they up, up uh, fronted nudity in the first season, the first episode. Like the weirdest thing about these shows is they try to get like, oh, we're edgy. So the first episode is chock full of nudity, and then there's no nudity for the rest of the show. It's just such a totally bizarre thing. And I'm not against nudity in film or TV shows, 
but it's like it that feels gratuitous when it's just to hook you for the first episode it's like a bait and switch almost anyhow <laughs> that's my thoughts on marvelous and miss mazel which also does not have a laugh track and upload does not have a laugh track in fact I think almost no comedy show I watch these days has a has laugh tracks. It's, it's only sitcoms. It's only network sitcoms that have laugh tracks anymore. Even half those, even half of the you know network sitcoms aren't you know like The Office or I always go back to The Office, Parks and Rec, uh, what's what, Modern Family. They don't have sit, they don't have laugh tracks because it's just kind of going out of style. How you doing? I can't say that name with a stuffed nose. Love Boat definitely needed a laugh track, just not funny. <laughs> I never, I was too young to watch a Love Boat. Are we bashing stuff? No. I saw Joker. You didn't like it one bit? I like Joker. You know, I think the thing with Joker is people like say, oh, Joker is just trying to rip off Taxi Driver. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I admit that. I, I would say, I'd go so far to say that the guy that created Joker, I don't know who, I forget who it was, if you if you said, "Hey, are you trying to are you trying to pay homage to the taxi driver?" He said, "Yeah, I am." <laughs> because I think what's happened with with comic book movies is basically it's like I think comic book movies are also at the point where they have to they they can't just be comic book movies forever. They got to try to evolve and like incorporate other genres and try to try to bring themselves more, you know, more ideals. Eh. Nah, com- because Tax Driver and King of, King of Comedy did it better. Well, but the King, of- but neither of those had a Batman a- angle to it. <laughs> That's the thing, you know. Like King of Comedy it doesn't have a Batman angle. That's the whole point. I wanted a Batman angle. <laughs> uh, seeing what I see is not watching what I watch. Oh, I'm not sure. Era of seasons behind instead of seasons of era. Okay, yeah. I think you're talking about, you're talking about seasons of television? Seasons of television. Oh, was the creepy self-love solo dancing other intense character acting that was horrible for me. It was slow and nasty. I think, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. It, it, if you didn't see it in theaters, I think it has a different effect. You know, like I, I, will, I will defend, uh, like Blade Runner has a scene. Like, I talked about this many, many times. I'll say it again because why not? Uh, it, where, where Decker just basically looks at the computer screen and is like, up and enhance. Go up three, three, three dots, enhance. And it's just like literally one shot for like about maybe two minutes. And all you do is hear the rain. And it's, if you're watching on a TV at home, it's boring AF. It's ter- It's like super boring. So now if you watch it, like in a, if you watch Joker and he's just like, you know, Doing the self, you know, like he's doing that thing, and he's like got his shoulder blades popping, he's popping and co- popping and locking, you know, and it just feels, yeah, I could see how it could feel like, like ew, uh, but in the movie theater, there's there's kind of a like a dread to it. I don't know. And also, you know, let's not discount the fact that Joker has been so talked about. Like, like I find it hard. I like I did a stream and I, I got. People got pissed off at me for not liking Squid Game. But I think I would have liked Squid Game more had, had everyone not told me how great Squid Game was. I would have probably liked it more. I would been, well, I would have not liked it. I would have not liked it less. <laughs> I, would have not, I would have hated it less, I guess I'm going to start to say. Yeah. So, you know, eh, I don't blame you. Didn't work on you. That's fine. Uh, let's see. Mr. Mizzle says, oh, wait, no, Mr. Mizzle, David Parkins, Perkins says, BBT, Big Bang Theory, used the, the reverb to make it sound like a, like being presented in a large theater. Oh, okay. Yeah, perhaps. I, ne- I didn't know, I've never noticed that. The thing is, though, w- with laugh tracks, like I said um, earlier, th- you, there, are, there are various different sizes of laugh tracks. So you can get, like, huge theaters, you know, and I was buying, like, commercially available soundtrack stuff. Uh, Foley stuff, or not Foley, but uh, sound effects. And there are, obviously the studios have their own like libraries, laugh track libraries that are probably proprietary that they don't share with anybody else. <laughs> uh, there we go. Hey, John, if you could make a film for one IP with a blank check, what would you take a crack at? Oh, good question. 
Good question. Um, so the first thing that pops up in my head, like one of my favorite novels of all time, although it's been done three times, I haven't, I haven't seen the recent, well, it's done more than three times, is The Great Gatsby. Like, I read The Great Gatsby as a kid. I love The Great Gatsby. Like, I read it before I had to read, read it for, like, junior year. I read it in, like, seventh grade, and I loved it. I read it, had to read it in junior year, and I totally got it. You know, like I, I was the only kid in, the, in my English class that aced the test because everyone else didn't didn't read the book. They were lazy, and then I got I got an A on that that. And then, but the problem is the next the next uh, uh, book we had to read, Catcher in the Rye, I got a C because I didn't really understand what the hell Catcher in the Rye was about. Um, but yeah, I, I would have tackled Great Gatsby. The interesting about Great Gatsby is the. Um, Coppola version. Coppola wrote a script for the 1976 version, and the script is super, 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 super close to the book. Like, like you could watch that movie and not read the book and get almost 100 percent of every, everything in the in the book because it's so close. They even literally pull words right out of the book and use them as narration in the movie. Unfortunately, to me, that made that movie incredibly boring. And just terrible. Just I, I hate it. I don't like that version. I mean, I don't like uh, I don't like what's her name in it. Hey, Rick, how you doing? Thanks for the super chat. Welcome to the board. Um, Woody Allen's wife, Mia Farrow. I, I'm not a fan of Mia Farrow. Just sorry. It's just I did. I don't get it. Mia Farrow. And I never did watch the next. I did not I didn't watch the Leonardo DiCaprio version. Although uh, the the director is making the El, an Elvis movie, so that'd be Baz Luhrmann. Baz Luhrmann has been, you know, I, I, at first I didn't like, I did like Moulin Rouge. I think it wasn't the second time I watched Moulin Rouge. I kind of figured out like, this guy is nuts, but it's kind of an interesting nuts. So I'm curious to see how, how, uh, how, uh, the Elvis movie will do. But yeah, Gatsby was probably, I mean, unfortunately Gatsby's been done twice already. So I probably couldn't tackle it. Um, I would love it for a movie like if I had a pretty decent size check, I don't need a big one. I would love to tackle the uh, musical um, uh, uh, "Triumph of Love." I I love that musical. Um, it is there, there's also a movie with Mia Mia Sardon. Uh, what's that lady? Mia, the daughter of that one gangster from Goodfellas. But anyhow, and Ben Kingsley's in that one too. But uh, Triumph of Love is about this woman who falls in love with this prince who, who resides in this court of, like, order and reason. And so she decides, but the order and reason is only, like, for, like, so she, dis, well, no, she disguises herself as a man to go to this court and pretend to be, to, to like, try to get lessons from the king. But the king realizes that she's actually, he, she, he's actually a she, and then, he, and then she's like, well, don't tell anybody I really came here because I love you. And so she starts having an affair with the king, or not the king, but like the, the, the uncle of the prince. And then the, she shows herself off to the prince, who thinks originally she thinks she's a man, but then realizes that she's a woman. And then, but then the, the, the aunt finds out, but she's like, no, I'm not really a woman. I'm really a man. So she's, it's like a triple gender blend bender kind of thing. May not work in today's uh, climate, but I think it's, and it's written in like, like 1600, 1700, 17 something or another. It's a French uh, French uh, novel or play, originally written in French, and then adapted in the, in, you know, the 2000, or 19, 1990s or something like that into a musical. And I love that. And I've never seen it done because I, 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 I thought that was a great musical. Uh, is there a new adaptation of Cyrano? I think I heard about that, but I don't know what that one is about. Oh yeah, it's who's in it? It's someone. It's don't they gender swap Cyrano? And here's the thing too: I'm not against gender swapping. Uh, I'm not against gender swapping. Like, like what if we had a female Cyrano? That's I, I get that that one. You know, well they did that with the truth about cats and dogs. Um, it's it's totally it's totally a valid valid experiment artistic thing to gender swap uh a character um but you gotta like uh, you gotta like change some things you can't like because it's a way to explore different identities and different roles so if you gender swap 
Sarah and Bergerac, what's it come like coming from a woman's perspective? You want to try to imp- in, you can't just leave everything else the same. You have to actually change it, you know. Um, but uh, so I, I forget. Well, yeah, who is the who is the news? Oh no, it's Peter Dinklage. That's right. Peter Dinklage is the uh, Sarah and Bergerac. So it wasn't gender swapped. I'm thinking the truth about cats and dogs. That was gender swapped. That was Janine Garofalo and Uma Thurman back in the day. If you remember that movie, then congratulations, you're probably 40. <laughs> There's a great line in, in, in the movie, uh, in the show Upload, I talked about earlier. Uh, they're at, the, they're at the, uh, the, uh, the tech store, and it's like, you see this old guy, he's like, what is this? How do I log in? And he's like all confused. He's all befuddled with his VR goggles. He's like, oh, what is that? I don't know what's going on here. And the sales like, sheesh, guys, millennials. Are you, am I right? <laughs> that was a great line. Yeah. Back when she was hot. I could say both, about both women there. <laughs> well, I mean, Uma Thurman's still pretty good looking, right? Judy Garofalo, eh. Yeah, so I have. I wanted to play with the gender swapping. Um, I wanted to take Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and put the put that voice in women's in women's characters. So I was curious. I was wanting to do that as a as a not as a video, but as just as a acting experiment. Uh, doing it here, like just just get some friends together, get some ladies, and have them just like just read Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Like, I don't know if you guys ever ever read Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. Like you've probably seen the movie. I mean, the movie's pretty close. Although in the play, the play basically takes place over like three scenes. Um, there's only just like three locations. But uh, and it's most and it, it is full of what would be probably problematic uh, language today because it's it is very oh it's just salesman people being you know just just kind of bullshitting. But I thought it'd be fun to see what would a woman bring to it. How could a woman speak like speak these words and make them work for them? You know, for a female perspective. Star Trek: The Original Series last episode, the Turnabout Intruder introduced a gender swap, feature gender swapping. Ah, oh, no, I don't even remember the Star Trek: Last Generation, uh, the original series. I'm sorry, I never watched all of them. I watched a lot of them, but. It's funny when I went to college, my screen I had I took one class in filmmaking, which is called screenwriting, intro to screenwriting. That's the only class they offered actually in my college that had anything to do with the movies, because I didn't go to a film school. I went to business school, and that was you know that fulfilled my art requirement. Although I, I was a band member, so I played that anyway. Um, but the lady that taught that I had actually written like maybe had two credits on the original series, Star Trek. She had and her favorite movie. She was like she showed it at the very beginning of the class was uh what's the name of that movie blank and galaxy quest this is one of her favorite movies because she's like this is so accurate <laughs> galaxy quest is so accurate to to william shatner and the whole you know whole experience of that changing constants to variables tests the generality of an th- idea yep yeah that's why you want to use well, you want to use variables sometimes to hold. It's always dangerous to to plug numbers into some into an equation. Saying, "Oh yeah, it works. See, my theory works," because not all numbers work. Mister Mizzles, have you ever seen a movie called Death Trap with Michael Caine? Michael Caine, Michael Caine, and Christopher Reeve? No, I haven't seen that. That would be an interesting gender swap to a lot of Chekhov gun, uh, also a lot of Chekhov gun examples. Yeah, you know, like that's a th- you know, people get all up- uppity about gender swapping characters. I mean, yes, gender swapping a character just to do it is kind of annoying. Like that like that's just annoying. But if you do it in a way that's like, okay, let's see what happens if it's from a different perspective. You know, and again, to broaden it out too, you, you can just not only do gender swapping, you can do ethnic swapping, you know. Have it played by different different ethnic character again you know it, it's it depends too like you don't want to necessarily do it with something like lord of the rings where it doesn't quite make sense but yeah like i said gray area not gonna be consistent <laughs> in the episode of, oh talking about star trek still a woman switches between bodies with captain kirk and then tries to take over command of the enterprise nice sexy i'm thinking of zach brannigan at that point 
If Zach Brannigan got taken over by a woman, oh yeah. Never mind. <laughs> oh, how you doing? All right. Uh, let's see. Voyager did it right with Star Trek Jane. Jane, yeah, she was a great captain. She didn't really get much. She didn't get the uh, Captain Jane way. She never got like the. Uh, she didn't really get to me. I never think about her when I think about all the Star Treks. Then again, I, you know, I keep forgetting Voyager existed. I don't know. I kind of was checking out by then. I kind of think the opposite ways. I don't care if they swap race or whatever. If the personality of the character remains, that's true. And, and, and again, a case by case basis, right? Because sometimes you don't want to gender swap something. Like you would never like James Bond would be interesting to gender swap James Bond, but it would certainly not be James Bond anymore. You know, because you you can't have that. There's no feminine angle from James Bond. It just doesn't make sense. At that point, it becomes something else. You know, it's like. You know, it's, well, it's Black Sparrow. It's, you know, it's Black Widow or any of those female s spies. It's a different role. It really is. Oh, yeah, gender swap Starbucks. See, I never watched the original Battlestar Galactica, so I don't know, I don't have a reference to what the original, I love Battlestar Galactica. I thought that was great. I thought it was one of the greatest shows, sci-fi shows of the uh, new, the new uh, 2000s, the new era. Like I couldn't care if JJ's Kirk was black was a black woman if he acted like a TOS character. I, he, yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. That might be for me. That might be a bit too far. Like I, I think it's better to to gender swap something where you're not like you don't have a preformed opinion. Like Cyrano de Bergerac, you know, a black woman playing Cyrano de Bergerac. Why not try it? it? Might work. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any investment in that character. I guess in that sense, maybe I'm. Maybe I'm totally off base. Maybe I'm problematic for saying stuff like that. I don't know. I'm open to that. You know, I don't want to necessarily take a hard stance on that. The new odd couple. Okay, there you go. There's an example. Why not take the odd couple, featured all black cast. Man, back in the day, back when I was a kid, in the old days, we used to have TV shows that had all black casts. Had no problem with that. Now they're probably, they're probably considered problematic. I used to watch Hang with Mr. Cooper, Family Matters. Uh, what other ones were there? Well, you're going back to the you know 70s too, with like like Sanford and Son. You know, like you used to watch all that stuff. I don't know. I don't want to get too too racial politics here. It's not that kind of a show. All right. I never uh, need to watch Stargate SG One. I love them. I never watched any of the Stargate stuff. <laughs> Jefferson's, yeah. Jefferson's was a spinoff of All in the Family, right? Yeah. I never watched, I honestly never watched All in the Family or the Jeffersons. Like, I, I don't, I didn't, when I was growing up, I didn't have Nick at Night, so I never watched the older, older uh, sitcoms. Although I did watch a lot of Gilligan's Island. What's really troubling for me is, like, if, if I talk to people that are younger than me, like, hey, you remember Gilligan's Island? And like, no. Like, oh, no, what's wrong with you? Because, you know, I was subject to basically whatever they played in syndication on my Fox affiliate. I, I grew I mean, I grew up on Fox. Like, I, I never, I honestly spent like 90% of my childhood watching Fox. And like maybe 10% maybe watching the other channels. I, I loved watching Fox as a kid. The Simpsons, you know, Married, well, I, didn't, I didn't really watch that much Married with Children as a kid. I grew, didn't really, my dad kind of thought it was like a little too, too risque for me. And he was right. <laughs> But I, I grew up on Fox, but Fox would always run Gilligan's Island reruns. So you'd, on Saturdays, you get like an afternoon of Gilligan Island reruns and Mr. Belvedere and like, uh, what's the other one they used to do on that channel? Oh, Step, uh, the, the one, the robot, the Vicky, Vicky the robot girl. So. Oh, I didn't realize that Roland Emmerich was directed Stargate. Roland Emmerich has definitely made a uh, a career now of, of the kind of movie that he makes now. It's just, it's it's, you know, there. When I was watching, uh, there's a movie. What was the name of that movie where the Gorn or the Gorb comes down to Earth from the '50s, the day the Earth stood still, right? If you ever watch the original '50s version, then you watch like the the Keanu Reeves version. It's very, they're very similar. But there is something about that kind of sci-fi, that 50s sci-fi, where it is highly 
geared toward the teenage mind. Like it's it's literally like this is what teenagers imagine being a hero is like. Like super super simplistic. But there's kind of an innocence to that. There's there's sort of a uh, just just a you know I, I watched some of those things like the last the last movie that Emmerich made, uh, Moon Moonfall. There is an innocence to the kind of story. Like it's not it's so freaking dumb, but it's it's sort of innocent in that sense of being dumb. Like it's so stupid. I don't. Know, there's something about the '50s movies where the '50s, like you know. I want to say I want to include Poseidon Adventure. Oh, that's not fifties, um, but you know, like the Earth stood still, the day the Earth stood still. A lot of the, even the Godzilla, some of the Godzilla movies, I guess, some of the later Godzilla movies, not the original, you know, Japanese versions, the ones where they more Americanized. It's just it's just kind of silly, dumb, matinee popcorn flick kind of a thing. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just babbling. Sorry, guys, my nose is all screwed up. <laughs> not 90 hours like the joke uh, the, what is that I, the, remind me what that is because that, that sounds so familiar I'm going to blow my nose real quick get off the mic <sighs> ah excuse me alright alrighty Dr. Daystrom and the ultimate computer anyhow small wonder thank you Boa Mike I'm Welcome to the stream, a chill out stream for Wednesday. Uh, let's see here. The blob, there you go. The blob, the fly, the thing from another world. Yep. Yeah, the, that kind of like, there's, there's an innocence to that kind of film. It's literally, you know, that's a pr the problem with superhero movies really is that superhero movies has gotten so damn big. Like, everything is so world-threatening. Like, you can't just have a superhero movie where it's just, oh, I need to stop this guy. You know, it's just it becomes like, oh, now we need to stop this world from being, you know, crashed. And that's just basically build up, build up, build up, build up, build up, build up. And so the nice thing about, well, I mean, not that say that the blob and the fly and the thing are necessarily small movies, but it's like they have a smaller objective. They, they, the hero's got to overcome a smaller thing. It's not like, and it's used, It's not full of cynicism. It's not full of, you know, like oh, but there's the you know CIA is secretly working with the blob. It's more. It's just more, uh, uh, you know, more, just more contained. Speaking of which, I, I downloaded this Audible book yesterday. It's free on Audible if you have an Audible account. Uh, let's see if I can find it. It's. It got me thinking. Like this is actually pretty cool. This is a cool like, where where the audio book is going to go. Basically, it's becoming a radio play. It's called Impact Winter. If you can, if you ever seen it, and I only listened to like I fell asleep to. It. I mean, I just turn I turn these on to fall asleep to stuff. But it's like it's like super well produced. So it's like a radio play. Total whiteout. Should we go? Should we go? Anyhow, it's it's like it says it's from like the the creators of. I don't know, some people are involved with The Walking Dead or not, but basically a comet hits the Earth and then, then it creates these zombies. And so they're, but it's really well produced, lots of, all the different actors. You know, it's, it's it's a radio play. It's literally a radio play, only we don't call it that anymore. We call it an audio, audible exclusive, but it's a radio play. But yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool to hear that radio plays come back again. Make some chicken soup. Oh, that's a good idea. I, I've, got, I've got the carrots and I've been... I've been. I actually make a lot of chicken soup since I got my food ninja. I, I like chicken soup. I just, I just like making it, and it's delicious. Yeah, Mr. Missiles, the audio dramas are definitely making a comeback, and they, 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 uh, they're great. I remember when. So my, the end of my screenwriting um, class, the teacher had us, or had a couple of people join her for, um, we we're, were editing radio plays. So we were doing like radio plays. So I actually worked on one radio play. Uh, I'm doing all this Foley effects and all the sound effects on that. And that's when I first did some audio work, and that was with a program called Cool Edit Pro. If you guys remember Cool Edit Pro, now if you if you're an Adobe fan, Adobe bought them and made basically audio uh, Adobe Audition. That's Cool Edit Pro. <laughs> yeah, an audio exclusive. What is this? 
Well, I just think you can't buy it from anybody else. You only get it from Audible. Which I, I honestly don't know who else is, who else sells Audible book, Audible audio books. Was that the Jack Black King Kong? Or are you talking about something else? King Kong released in synchronization with the build of the big skyscrapers. <laughs> yeah. I guess a feature presentation is automatically in movie. What do they call a streaming exclusive? They just call it like an Apple Plus exclusive or, a, you know, Amazon Prime exclusive. Only on Amazon Prime. Yeah, yeah, you're true. TJ Maxx says, Audible dramas have been making a comeback since 2013. They make up a whole category of podcasts. Yeah, it's true. I haven't even, I haven't even dug in. Honestly, I haven't dug into podcasts outside of just basically talk. I'm sure there's a lot of podcasts that are literally well-produced, you know, full-on stories. I know there's a couple of them that people tell me about where it's basically like it, it's a it's a written doc it's a written story, but it's pre- they pretend to be a podcast. It's about this uh, this weird town. I'm sure some of you guys probably know what I'm talking about. I want to say like nowhere Alaska or something like that, but I don't know what the name of the thing is. <laughs> Can't make jokes, maybe that ruined mood. There's a great, uh, there's a great actually scene analysis that uh, Quentin Tarantino does that I think is, I, I, I really like listening to Quentin Tarantino talk about movies, and he talks about that scene where Joker shoots Robert De Niro in the face. And uh, he's like, he finally, like, he got the audience to basically get on the worst side. I think, yeah, that's what it is. Welcome to Nightville. That's what I'm talking about. Everyone keeps telling me I should listen to that. But never get around to it. Definitely should check it out. Well, uh, any other questions you guys have for me? Because I'm going to get going pretty soon because my nose is just not having a good time. And my throat's getting a little dry, too. I am working on, I mean, I I keep bouncing around what, what my next video will be. <laughs> Because I'm in the middle of a lot of house work, and actually my business is starting to pick up a little bit, so I'm going to be quite busy. But hey, that's good because I need to actually do stuff, not just stare at my mess and feel bad about my life all the time. Um, but <laughs> we can get into that later. Uh, but uh, I do want—I I, I thought of a way of talking about um, normal lenses. That's really interesting, like really cool idea. Of, of, I've, something I've always thought about as far as normal lenses. And I've gotten this question a lot when I, in my video about lenses. I talk about the normal lens in cinematography considered two times the width of the sensor, which a lot of people like, like, like have questions about. It took me like literally four, like four or five days of just sitting there looking at the computer trying to figure out what this one book was trying to say. And I think I finally cracked the egg on how to explain what a normal lens is in a way that that satisfies everything. And it actually led me to, to looking at um, specs from the SMTPE and THX on the, the uh, well, not proper, but like the uh, ideal viewing angle of, the, of, a, of a theater goer. Because I'm trying to redo my house, and I haven't bought a TV since 2005, at least not a TV for my home entertainment. So I'm like, well, time to buy a new TV. Now I can sit and figure out where I'm going to sit and measure the distance and figure out the viewing angle to be in line with the SMTPE uh, recommendation for uh, theater size. And it turns out it's going to be like a 75-inch or 70-80-inch 70, television is what I'm looking at uh, for where, where I want to sit. And I was like, oh, good. I can actually, maybe I can play like a video game and actually be able to read the text that's on the freaking game because I can never see it, dang thing, on the, on the screen. What about one-eyed people? Oh, yeah. I'm not even going to touch that whole thing about the one-eyes. Uh, if you want to look up uh, Schlitz Pitt's uh, Helmholtz, if you want, your name reminded me of the, uh, of the, uh, the technique. There's something called the Helmholtz Pincushion Chessboard, which, is, which blew my mind. Like, the whole idea of a normal lens is that it's supposed to reproduce the, the angle of view of the human eye. Although the human eye is really... It's questionable whether you can actually reproduce it because of the biology and the curvature of the retina. I'm going to avoid all of that in my video. Totally avoid it. And uh, I'm going to talk about, um, basically, we're, we're talking about angles of view when it gets down to it. But the, anyway, Helmholtz's pincushion uh, chessboard, look it up. 
It's basically a chessboard, like a checkers, you know, but it's pin cushioned, like, you know, like, like, like a fisheye lens. But the freaky thing is, if you move it really close to the screen and you look at it, the pin cushion goes away. And it just proves to you that your eye, like when it's something that's really close, your brain and your eyes don't see the curvature anymore, which proves that your retinas are curved. Creepy. It's, it's, it's wild. It freaked me out when I first did it. Like, oh, my goodness. Andy. Ah, Ritz, uh, Rick's fallen to my passion here. I 3D printed some parts for a camera slider. Yes. Now I'm programming the computer to... Oh, my, yeah, baby. Oh, that's going to be fun. I haven't really... I've only printed one thing for my business... Well, for my video work on... Oh, no, I printed two things. For my, vi for my video, I did. I printed a, so a stand for my Blackmagic Mini, uh, A10 Mini, for, for, so it sits off the table a little bit. So I made that. And I printed a cover for a Rode microphone where I lost the cover. Like, I lost the battery cover. I couldn't find it. And no one was selling it for anything. So I was like, okay, well, somebody out there like, designed it. And so I printed it. And it was a little bit off because it was for a different model. I just just snipped off some pieces that were offending, and it, it fits perfectly. So it's cool. And yeah, the closer you sit, your eye is to the subject, it's curvature. It's it's more than that. It's even the close. Well, the closer you sit is the wider the angle of view. So if you if you're really cl if you sit in the really close front of a theater, you need to have a normal lens that is very very wide in order to your normal lens definition is very, very wide. So it might be even less than, you know... The, so the whole point of the video is going to be like, normal lenses are completely subjective. It depends on how you, where you sit to, in relationship to the image is what is technically a normal. So, but the thing about that is, at, at some point, like, who cares? We've gotten so... The human brain and society, and we've gotten so used to just seeing all different kinds of representations of angles that we don't really need a normal lens. Like, you, I mean, it's good to know what it is, but does, you don't necessarily need to be exactly a normal lens. So I mean, people get like super hyper, like, oh, I need to have a 43.5 millimeter lens because that's exactly what a normal lens is. It's like, no, no, it's not exactly 43.5. It depends on where you're sitting from in relation to the picture you're looking at. Anyhow, I'll, I'll be a part of the video if I ever get to finish writing it. Candy. I need to write the candy video too. Remind me of candy. <laughs> Can you print a burger? There. I want to print this. Really, there's a there is a really cool handgun that someone designed on uh, Colts, and it's it looks like a nine millimeter, I guess, but it's a rubber band handgun. So if you painted it a certain way, it, it would legitimately look like a. You would basically you pull it on a cop, you will get killed. Let's set it that way. Um, so I wanted to print that, and cause it, it fires rubber bands. It's amazing, but it's all—it's all like one piece. You just you print it, and it's ready to go. It's insane. What is this, a cake for ants? All right, never mind. <laughs> I'm very sensitive to an image that doesn't have a proper aspect ratio. Yeah, yeah, I know. Especially if stuff gets lopped off the sides. They try to do that. The Simpsons make it 16 by 9. You can tell if it's only 1% or 2% off. I can't. Because remember, like, theaters in the old, you know, theaters also had to mat off the, the, the projection. I mean, yeah, maybe you're maybe sensitive to that, too. Like, if you go to the theater, like, you know, every movie has, the curtains are supposed to be a certain distance to create the certain, you know, mat lines. So everything, everything is always... Uh, what is the proper aspect ratio? It's the ratio that you decide. What you ask, you, it's up to you. What's your aspect ratio? What you want to go for? Are you thinking about distortion? Uh, not not aspect ratio. Oh, are you ta or are you talking about like s stretching people in and out that kind of thing? Maybe yeah. I I am I am not that. So it's not one or two percent. I'm sensitive maybe ten percent, not one or two. How does it print a uh, single print without moving parts? Good question. So basically what it does is it creates uh, interlocking pieces that can only be made if they're printed that way. So you can, if you print one thing like that, you can print something like that. And then once you, once you break it off the support, it's basically like a chain. It's free to move. 
And so it's very intriguing how they they figure, you know, they print all this stuff. Now, there might be some pieces that you break off as you first, you know, you get it going at first. But, uh, yeah, it's, I'm curious. I, I, I downloaded it. I just haven't uh, printed it yet. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, John, whatever happened to predictability, the milkman, the paperboy, an evening, t- an evening TV. Yep. You, you see that uh, background there. You, you realize that the song that, so that guy that wrote that song, he, he's, he, um, is famous because he, he wrote like several sitcom songs. And I thought, and I, what I was, what I remarked about that was every sitcom song that he wrote, this guy, he's famous for writing like a ton of them. They all have to do with nostalgia. So whatever happened to predictability, the milkman, the paperboy, and evening TV. It's, and then uh, the other song, uh, Family Matters, I think it was, it was about, uh, about, you know, like past. Every, every sitcom show, the lyrics are always about some sort of nostalgia or comfort. It's sort of it's sort of like the way it's like they're priming you psychologically. Oh, this show's about comfort and the good times. Good times, you know, whatever. Uh, it's about you know, it's about nostalgia. It's about family, right? They're always priming you with that stuff. <laughs> Upload is thirty percent downloaded. Very good, very good. Uh, yeah, I hate that too, Rick. When they have it stretched to the screen fit and all that. Ugh terrible yeah none of them made sense that's the whole thing like like those shows like the sitcom openings theme songs don't actually comment on the show you know it's the weirdest thing uh yeah but i had yeah, i went down that whole line of just going through all the all those sitcom sitcom songs yeah it, it was literally one guy because you, you could hear that same style it's like that rock Folk rock sound that was really popular in the 80s and 90s. Right? Yeah. Anyhow. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, that's okay. I've been on for an hour. I know. Last time, if you guys want to do a critique of your video, I'm going to put it out there again. We didn't do it this time because I really didn't feel up to it. I got too much other stuff and I didn't, I didn't get any submissions. Although I might go back and show one of the ones the other ones that but if you have another one yes definitely gilligan's island definitely one of the best because it sets up the gilligan's island story um but anyhow if you guys have a short film it can be a film it can be a video it can be a commercial hey i haven't done a commercial in a while i'd love to do a commercial even if it's a even if it's like a mattress commercial for your local mattress dealership i loved i i started cutting my teeth on mattress no, I never did a mattress commercial. I started cutting my teeth on uh, on car commercials. I did a lot of like used car commercials. Uh, anything you want me to take a look at, and we will do it in a way that's uh, informative and perhaps useful for the rest of the audience. Um, I just want to hang out with you guys. I know you guys are keep chatting at me. I keep talking. Make soup. Remember to make soup and keep a pack of hauls on hand. I got a bunch of hauls made in Canada. Oh, Canada. <laughs> so, all right. Hey, so thanks, guys, for hanging out. We'll be back next week, next Wednesday, sometime in the afternoon. Depends on how my schedule goes. And otherwise, we will talk to you guys later. Fade out, fade out. Click the button to fade out.